Good morning, Nick Barenta. How are you doing? Good morning, Jan Recker. Great. How are you? I'm I'm okay. I'm actually uh, I'm busy with PhD seminars. For some reason, I'm teaching a lot of PhD courses, and many of them doing uh, case studies, and you know, I'm reviewing their paper drafts and stuff like this. And and here's the thing: Have you ever heard of a failed case study? Like you go out to a case study and then you can't uh, write a paper from it, or it's a failed implementation. I only know students that say like, "I'm doing this case study and I'm gonna write about it." And I always think in my head, like, are you sure? I mean, how do you know? I mean, how do you, how do you know that your case study won't be a failure? I mean, why do we think that every case study is successful, you know, in the sense that there's something novel, there's something new, et cetera, right? So in quantitative research, it's a lot simpler. Like I remember in my PhD days, I did a survey and I was like, oh my God, let's hope for a significant beta coefficient, you know, like let's hope yeah. for the R square to be big, because if not, you'd have to do it over again. And when yeah, I did experiments, host. you always had to do them again. But with case studies, everyone thinks that every case study is always a success in the sense of there's always something new, there's always something worth publishing. And then it's just That's a matter a of writing point. as long as you point, right? So I wondered where are all the failed case studies? <laughs> <laughs> so I want to talk about failure. What do you think? Wow. All right. Uh, it's something I don't know much about. <laughs> 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 no, that's totally untrue. Uh, I've failed at a million different things. And I have stories here. But you know what? I think we should, uh, uh, you know, to join us to talk about this topic is our good friend, Lori Wessel. Lori, uh, of course, you're at the European New School of Digital Studies. I have you Googled here. Uh, a very nicely clean shaven face on your website. Although in person here, you're <laughs> scruffy and bearded. Uh, but welcome. We all are. We all are. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Laurie, good to have you. How are you? Thank you very much. I'm doing good. Uh, it's great to be here. Thank you for having me. Well, we thought of you naturally when we talked about failure. We thought, oh, who can we ask? <laughs> 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 no, that was a joke, of course. That was a joke, of course. Um, no, but, you know, like, let's get back on point. Like, my, I think my point still stands. Uh, I think that there is this tendency of people thinking that, especially in qualitative research, that it can never fail, yeah. you know? And that's why I always liked experiments, because it's, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a more humbling experience, because most of your experiments will fail. And whenever I hear people saying, like, oh, I'm doing experiments, and I was like, yeah, okay, you, you know, Talk to me in a couple of years after you've done your few failures. Yeah, plan to do a few experiments. You're never exactly. going to do just plan one. Plan for a few. Never heard of that with a case study. A case study is like, oh, I got access to this company. My PhD is basically a done deal, though. <laughs> what do you guys think? So you're talking about proposal stage case studies, right? Not published case studies where you, in any way, you have a post hoc account of what was going on. Yeah. yeah, I mean, like I, I was talking about the, uh, you know, I'm following this particular method and mm -hmm. uh, this, this, I don't know, you know, this latent belief that this particular approach to research cannot possibly fail, you know, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, uh, and of course there could be, it could be a case study about failure and we all know there's few of them, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's a long-term uh, thing that we have more success factor studies uh, than failure factor studies. Anyway, I just always thought that it's really interesting to think that, you know, that case studies and like any other approach to research can, of course, fail. You yeah. know? So we're talking about two different types of failure. One is yeah. failure of the research project. The second is failure of the project you're studying. <laughs> All right. So yeah. if I study an ERP implementation, did the ERP implementation fail? Uh, but the question is, if I go out now in 2022 and... I get access, then I do 40 interviews at an ERP implementation. Is it possible? And, and the ERP implementation went fine. Is it possible that I'll have nothing to say after those 40 interviews and not get published and not finish my PhD? So that's, I'm asking you guys, is, is, it, is that a possibility or will I always be able to get a PhD from doing 40 interviews? Well, I, I, I do think that type of research can fail especially in that topic, right? ERP implementation in the year 2022, or, you know, we, we know a lot about that topic already. There's lots of studies, qualitative, quantitative, meta-analysis, you know, you do, you've done one of them. Uh, so uh, I think there is a risk that you don't find anything new. 
There's also mm-hmm. risk in this type of work that you're saying, I'm going to do these 40 interviews, you, you know, but maybe you won't. Maybe something hits the planet and people get too busy. Like, for example, like we, we secured access to this one big retail company here. We started doing work with them. And then they called us and said, I'm really sorry, guys, but we have to you know, focus on our supply chain because we don't get any wheat from the Ukraine region anymore. We can't, you know, we can't entertain a, a bunch of researchers anymore. Uh, call us again in 2025 when we got the situation settled. So, yeah, so that was a failure in, in a sense because we had to start afresh, really. Yeah. Yeah, so the the way I think of two, two points to make here. The, the if you're studying, a, so from a supervisor's perspective, when I would give feedback on a proposal that addresses a topic that is fairly well developed, could be ERP implementation um, or other topics that have been researched quite a lot. I would, as a, even though I'm a qualitative researcher myself, perhaps always be a bit more towards suggesting to do a more quantitative study because if the field of research is well developed it seems more likely that there's accumulated body of knowledge that you can draw on and indeed a qualitative study is perhaps a bit unlikely to yield really fundamental new new results to that yeah. um, secondly i would always advise i would always argue for keeping the proposal a bit more open and perhaps go into the field early with a set of open interviews simply to to let some key informants tell you what's going on and what they think is a real challenge to them and this way there's a, perhaps some potential to find out whether what the company under scrut or the organization under scrutiny whether all their problems can well be explained and in scholarly wise indeed you have nothing new to say or whether there's any new interesting problem emerging from what those practitioners will tell you um, so I'm always a friend of having a smaller, smaller sample of interviews done fairly open, fairly early, just to get a bit of feeling for what's going on and also yeah. helping to, to build some trust, which, of course, as Jan described, the, the risk that a company pulls out is tangible. It's, it can happen. Well, it can happen, you know, with all of them. So, um I mentioned experiments beforehand. Uh, maybe I, uh, one of the first failures that I had with experiments and it you know, haunts me to this day. So I, at some stage, I got really interested in experiments. It's a really beautiful, clean way of doing science, right? Really, really like it, still do. So my, my first attempt, attempt an experiment, and back in the days we did uh, process modeling, you know, so sort of like one group gets diagram type A and has colors on them. The other one gets type B and doesn't have colors on them. Pretty basic stuff with diagrammatic reasoning, right? So anyway, so the first experiment, we set it up and we think about it very deeply and we build everything and we pilot and pretest, et cetera. And then back in the day, so 2006, you had to scramble to get participants. And we were ambitious, so we didn't want to get student proxies. We wanted to get real practitioners, which was you know, not very common that day. And so we managed and scrambled and worked really, really hard to get a total of, I think, around 200. And we were so proud because it's, you know, that's a really solid number for a very simple two group experiment with practitioners, not students. So it was like, wow, awesome. Now we run the experiments and it was in an online instrument. So, you know, they they basically click through web pages, et cetera, and we captured everything in the database. And then I look at the data and I realize I forgot to capture one simple variable, namely group. I didn't have the ones and twos, the zero and one. I didn't know which one was the treatment group. Uh-huh. And in the beginning, I thought, oh, don't worry. I'll, I'll infer, I can infer that. Surely I can infer that from all the other variables. Well, no, you can't. <laughs> so wow. I still have that data set. I have 200 participants filling out comprehensions and problem solving questions about these models and stuff. And I don't know which one had the colors and which one that's did not. Mis- yeah. oh, well, that's just goodness. a mistake. I think that one's rare and that's your advisors or, or something. I mean, that's just, you know, that, that sucks. Well, that was, if you, if you think of failure, that's, that's my go-to example. That's I forgot failure. to say it like this one line of code, save yeah. this variable here as a zero or a one. <laughs> yeah. So one source of failure is mistakes. But I'm going to go back to where you guys started. There seem to be two different sources of failure, uh, say in case studies. One is it gets pulled out from under you before you got too far. So I had a very similar story. I, I was going to do my dissertation and I even did a proposal in my first like eight or 10 interviews. Uh, TRW and Ford Motor were doing a drive-by wire uh, yeah. 
program. So I was studying the engineers doing drive-by-wire uh, for the car. And then they pulled the program and they said, oh, sorry, we're not going to do this anymore. We, they stopped the collaboration between the two companies that I was studying. And I had a few interviews and they said, oh, yeah, and you're not, you can't publish from that anyway, because we're not going to do it. And I'm like, oh, great. So I defended my proposal. I had it and I had to pull out and I was already working with Young Jin on, on NASA. And then I just pivoted and, and that ended up being my dissertation. But so that's one. And that's a tough one because you hear stories of that all the time. And if you have, you know, and I've and a similar one is when you have, say, eight or nine interviews and then no one wants to talk to you anymore. Right. They got too busy. They, so they didn't stop the project. They didn't officially do it. There's just no one, you know, your person left, your champion left, something like that. So there's nothing official where they went away, but no one will, you can't get any more data. And then it's hard to publish from that. So that would be one failure, right? To secure your site. But the other failure, I think was interesting. And Lori started talking about this and giving some advice is, all right, you're doing a case study. Uh, how do you and, and you, you said, all right, one tactic for doing a case study, because yeah, if you conclude the case study, yeah, you've, you've studied something a bunch of other people have studied. We've been studying these systems and implementations and all that for years. What if you find nothing new, right? And then you can't, so what are the tactics? Lori, you had one that was conduct a few exploratory interviews and try and be really relevant. And, and uh, what, where does, and, and here's my problem with that one, Lori. What's relevant when I work with practitioners and they, they have their burning issue that they're dealing with, it's always something that we've done research on in the 1990s, right? They're interested yeah. in changing culture yeah. of their company. They're interested in uh, how can I be more effective in this? And, you know, it's like, well, what you need to do is go to our business school and, and learn our, our classes, <laughs> right? So the basic project management, uh, you know, it's, it's usually not cutting edge research that they're, that they're interested in. That, that's, that's right. I mean, you, you can ask them for, I mean, it's perhaps also depending on what type of study you're doing, whether you're leaning more towards design oriented work or more theory building work. Um, you could also ask them for how they deal with particular challenges that the literature, if they had some of those, that the literature doesn't really have an answer to. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's, I'm not saying that the, these open interviews are silver bullet. They're just, um, they, I guess, that they, I think they can some, mitigate some of the risks. So I, uh, I usually try to counter both of these types of failures by, by research design. And what I mean with this is, number one, when setting up such a project, I always try to employ some risk management tactic in, in the sense of, okay, what do we do if we lose control, if we lose access? What is our alternative option? So if I have a PhD student that says, I want to do this one case study, well, can we add a second? You know, if we have to, well, can we add a third? What is our fallback? I always ask for a fallback option. If the, um, you know, the, the access is not granted or the access wanes or the access is ineffective, you know, because I don't know, like many of the cases, I don't know in enough depth to know whether this is something uh, uh, interesting enough and fertile enough or whether the data will be good enough. So I try to build in something that's a little bit easier when you do quantitative stuff, because when you have quantitative setups, you can always add qualitative aspects to it as a fallback you know when you do uh, an experiment well do exit interviews when you do uh, surveys make sure you ask uh, open-ended text questions so you have at least some some qualitative answers in some stage right so that's usually a nice tactic uh, just to figure out if you don't get your uh, statistics the way that you want them maybe there's fallback options, other types of data you can draw back and at least explaining why you didn't get that or, you know, what else might be going on and stuff like that, right? And with case studies, very simple. Well, let's, let's get some more. Um, and if you don't get this type of data, make sure we get some other type of data and so forth. So you can design a little bit uh, uh, against these failures, I suppose, if you want to call them that. Which is why I wouldn't necessarily call them failure, if you're, if you're to be honest. Yeah. I mean, I, I still like the idea of saying like, well, case studies can fail. I mean, but, but that's part and parcel of the game, right? I mean, if we, we all knew that all of our research would always lead somewhere, well, then it wouldn't be research. Right. You know, so it's part of the game that your study won't work. And you know, it's sort of in an experiment is, is most of the experiments will not work. That's my base assumption. That's also my base experience. Most of the experiments don't work until I figure out what exactly is going on. I think it's pretty re presumptuous to believe that, you know, you do something and it'll poof, it ma magically works straight away. Uh, yeah. 
And, and that's true. Same with any quantitative, right? Just this morning, I had a research meeting where we're, we created this big data set and we're doing an econometric study uh, on some variables in the data set and it might not work. But what we ended up doing is collecting way more data than we yeah, needed. Exactly. And we have a uh, half a dozen kind of working hypotheses in our pocket. And, the, and, and we set up our hypotheses like horse races. So there are two alternative explanations. And if one, uh, if it's positive or negative, we win because it picks the, so what we're doing is essentially hedging ourselves by collecting more data than we need by hypo- yeah. having more working hypotheses than we need and setting them up so that we win one way or the other. Uh, what that is, is essentially a risk mitigation strategy, yeah. but, but you're both do qualitative stuff too. So so yeah, experiments, quantitative stuff, that's good. But for qualitative, let's talk about that for a minute because cases, you've both said something about you find nothing new. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to come out right now and make the statement that you can always publish from a case study, from a qualitative case study. Always. You never have to fail if you've done qualitative case studies. If you've done it well. No, mm-hmm. even if you've done it badly. If you've done Whoa. it well then you can actually publish at a top outlet, right? But here's, and here's my argument. <clears throat> if you've done it badly, and I see a lot of this, I see a lot of, you know, people uh, will go out, do something, explore it and recreate project management or recreate an implementation or, rec- you know, and they they went to the field, said, this is how we, I see it right now with digital transformation papers. I've probably gotten, I don't know how many in the last two years of digital transformation. And then they basically recreate just fundamental organizational change theory, but they're doing it in the context of digital transformation and what, and it's like, really uh, stop, freeze, you know, unfreeze, <laughs> whatever. Uh, and it's like, come on, the, the, you're, you're saying nothing new here. Right. So, uh, but what they'll do is they'll say it's new because it's digital transformation. Now that's not going to get published at MISQ. But if you send it to some crappy journal, they'll take it because they need articles. So is a failure not publishing from it? Well, you can always publish it. If you have 20 interviews at a case study and it's digital, yeah, I might not buy it, but that doesn't mean you won't publish it and you won't get your PhD and you won't have your hair doctor after your name or whatever in, in German, right? Uh, so, so failure is, is kind of a, now, if the point is I want to get published in MIS quarterly with my case study, and that's your goal, then you may fail uh, unless you do it. Yeah, stuff. it's an interesting point, right? I mean, it, it all hinges a little bit on what the, your definition of failure is. I mean, when, when, you know, this morning when I was thinking about do, that we do this podcast episode today, I was like, well, what's my what's the biggest failure that I can remember? And I can remember basically two types. One of them is the the one that I published something somewhere that I shouldn't have or I should have tried somewhere else. That's a little bit your argument, sort of like, oh, my God, I published in the wrong journal <laughs> or something. And the other one that really still bugs me is this. There were a few instances where I got a major revision or risky revise and resubmit and didn't do it. So someone mm. saw something in the paper and I didn't see it or I didn't want to put in the effort or it was too hard. Or I was too busy, whatever the reason was. These, like in hindsight, these really stick with me. I have one or two of these examples where I'm like, man, I wish I would have done that. Mm. Like, because yeah, apparently someone else is somewhere there and I don't even know what, what their reasoning was, but for some reason I decided, thank you, but no, thank you. Mm-hmm. You know, and that, that to me is a, f- failure in that sense because i let go of an opportunity so to speak yeah, yeah. that that bugs me if you look in, in looking back not so much the experiments that i did that failed because the results were not significant or whatever like that's expected and that's part and parcel i suppose but, but aren't we all brilliant in hindsight and what today seems as a failure was a very pragmatic rational maybe decision well rational decision back then I yeah. do be honest. Like I think, I think some of these decisions that are with myself, and I see them with others too, is really that looks like a lot of work. Let's not do it, yeah. <laughs> you know. And and, yeah. and so this is not. I don't think this is a brilliant hindsight rationality. It's just really that um, you're not realizing, you know, what other people apparently realize, yeah. and you maybe not realizing that you have to put in more effort. Uh, 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 uh. Well, mm. the 
the, my advisor, Kale, wrote these papers on information systems failure. He has some famous ones back in the 80s. And he had this idea of expectation failure. And the idea is nothing ever fails, right? In some objective sense or something, or maybe stopping a project is not a failure. It's a success because you learned or, or you tested something and realized it didn't work. So that experiment that you did that failed was not actually an overall failure because you learned and then you redid your experiment and your next one was better. And then your next, and then your third one was a success. So, exactly. so was it a failure? No. In the overall project, it was part of the project that led to your eventual success. Yeah. And so, uh, I think for many things that we tend to consider a failure, what they are, are momentary frustrations that in the long run can contribute to quite some significant progress in many ways, I think. Yeah. Okay, but can I can I come back to a set set of points that Nick was making before? So I fully agree. I think digital transformation is a very difficult topic because we know from org change literature from decades about radical change, incremental change, freezing, unfreezing, call it what you want. Um, and then to me, it's always the interesting part. Now, on a conceptual level, in what way? Is that what we call digital transformation, really different from what has been said before? And I agree that many of the papers that I've been reading, both in the review as a reviewer and then published pieces, in my view, oftentimes sidestep an engagement with some of the really central sources on, on, on tra organizational transformation. I'm not talking about digital transformation, I'm just talking about organizational transformation. Um, so I fully agree on this. Um, the other point you said... Well, real quick, before you get to the other point, except for your paper, of course, of and course. if people aren't familiar <laughs> with it, you have a, what is going to become, if it's not there already, a seminal paper, possibly. Oh, it is getting there really quickly. On digital transformation. And, and it's a really nice paper because it does in a different way. It characterizes how digital transformation is different than traditional IT. So it's a, it's a very nice paper. We'll, we'll click to And I'm very proud of your paper for a couple of reasons. One is I was running that paper -athon and you and your team came together in my little paper -athon to come up with that uh, to come up with that paper. Then it went through JS. That's right. That, this is the first uh, super successful paper -thon Outcome, right? The Laurie Wessel yeah. uh, and, and, and others, right? Roxana is on the team and, and others. Um, is AB on there? AB. Young mm -hmm. Yoke and Tina from Copenhagen. And Tina, yeah, yeah that's right. right. Yeah. Yeah, so that was cool. That was a, was Tina the faculty mentor of the group? Yes. Right? Yeah. yeah. So she, yeah. we got these mid career mentors. So that was perfect. That's exactly how these things should run. Uh, yeah. That was great. I remember it, sitting at your table, you had one. Maybe you had one of the cases, one of the other team members had another case and you're yeah. talking and you're comparing your cases and then you realized one was uh, IT, one was digital, right? You nudged us towards the Strong and Volkov papers on impositions and this was where the initial framing came from. Um, and um, yeah, we took it from there. I mean, in the beginning, it was a much different paper, you know, as, as is often the case. Um, but yeah, that, that was where it all came from. Yeah. Yeah, that was very nice. And Young Jin, who was running ISIS that year, was your your editor. And then I, I don't know if you know this. I was one of your reviewers that helped shape it. So so I'm very proud of that paper. <laughs> wow. I feel like uh, am I allowed to say this? Is that ethical to tell someone afterwards that you were I think it's before? fine, yeah. So I'm very proud of that in so many ways. I feel like I'm a hidden underneath, you know, because I was my <laughs> paper thought it was my I was a reviewer. I'm just very proud of that paper. So yeah. So so guys, oh, like, do do you recall what you would think call or conceive of as failures? You know, when you when you think about your 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 work? You know, like uh, I don't know. Yeah, but I'm gonna tell you why yeah. uh so yeah there are a couple that that I maybe failed and and I think I've abandoned a couple of projects and and that sort of thing. So that's all all there. I've gotten rejected more times than ever. And you know, I, I mentioned Kali had this idea of expectation failure. And this is what I find myself running into. I expect that this paper should be a top-tier paper, and it gets rejected a few times. And then I you can always publish it somewhere. Right, and then I publish it maybe at a an outlet that is is uh, not as strong as I think the paper's worth, and and in a sense that's an expectation failure. Is it some overall failure? No, I got my paper out there. If people are interested in it, they'll read it. You know, uh, so 
it's hard to really, I, I mean, when I joked at the beginning that I, I don't know anything about failure, it's weird because I've had, I, I like to think of them as speed bumps. <laughs> you know, I've gotten tons and tons of rejections. I've gotten way more rejections than revisions and acceptances. Of course. But I don't, I don't yeah. consider the rejections failure. I consider them momentary speed bumps on my eventual road to success, right? That's, I think that's a very important point. And um, let me build on that. And one question in the comment to you. So the question would be, you pointed out that maybe there is a paper you didn't publish in an outlet that you had initially planned to publish it in or intended to publish it. So to what extent do you guys think that it is actually possible to plan strategically for an elite level publication? Is, is, is Absolutely. It, yes? I would I would say so as well, but I think it it, it might be a, a thing of experience. I, I feel more comfortable in saying that now. I don't think I would have said the same thing ten years ago. But you sort of get a I guess you get a, a feel for it, and I do think in a lot of that experience and sort of the ability to sort of make such judgment calls or predictions or whatever you want to call them yeah. comes from being heavily involved in reviewing and editorial work. You just get a I feel you get a sense for what journals are looking for, what papers are looking for. And I think it's simply because you don't only get to see the, 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 the successes that published, you see most of the papers you see are the ones that fail, right? The ones that not go through and you start yeah. realizing why that is the case and you know what makes a successful paper or the, the ingredients of that and so forth. That's why I always say like reviewing is funny because it doesn't give you instant gratification. You're not going to wake up tomorrow, be better, but in the long run, You'll yeah. become so much better the more you review and the more you do, you know, senior reviewing, like editing and blah, 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 or organizing a track, or organizing a workshop where, again, you see 30 submissions and 10 of which will be presented or whatever. All of that in the long run, slowly but surely, will make you a way better scholar. If I had to pick one thing to make you better as a scientist, that would be it. I think. And, and uh, you're right. So reviewing helps. And, and in reviewing, this is what I see. So qualitative case-based work, the number one problem I see where if you do this and you have a data set like this, you can't publish in a top tier journal. So, so you do say 40 or 50 interviews. Okay. If you do 40 or 50 interviews the right way, you can almost guaranteed if find the right conversation to, and, and you, you will have a finding right? In any organization, if it's a remote, if you do 40 interviews the right way, if you do 40 interviews the wrong way, yeah, you'll publish something somewhere at some lower tier journal. And this is the key to interviewing. Then yeah. this is the number one problem I see. Uh, people ask their interviewees for the answer. Like, what do you usually do? Well, we do this and this, and they make sense of the situation for you. So all you're reporting is how the interviewee made sense of like, yeah, on Mondays we do this. And then, you know, we did, and, and they, they already processed all of it. If that's how you do your interviews, you can't publish from it. But if you do your interviews, like maybe they, they process a little bit of it and then they turn around and tell you actual stories. Well, first he came in and said this, then I did this. And this is why I did this, right? And they actually give you very specific stories about first A happened, then B happened, then C happened. And then you probe around those stories. Why did C happen? What? And then you ask other people about those same stories. And then you get really deep information about actual stories. That's when you can then apply some theoretical scheme around them and use those as evidence for some argument, right? Uh, but I see so often people, I don't know, have you guys seen this where people are just like, uh, the, their informants kind of provide the answer and their quotes aren't actual stories. Their quotes are like their perception of the answer to the why the, whatever the implementation was successful, you know? Yeah. Uh, so this is one thing I always try to push for and do is like get the person you're interviewing into telling you specific stories that are very concrete exemplify yeah, their general absolutely. claims or say they they come you you get some general phrase like the strategy wasn't successful okay what 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 was why do you think did your strategy didn't work in that context what was the particular problem can you give us a, a, a concrete story and then they will go and, yes and that's I, how you get to it you start with the generalities well what happened well strategy wasn't successful well why wasn't it successful well because these things never are we have a bad culture well, tell me about a specific situation where your culture got in the way. Yeah. And then now they have to, well, it always happens. Mm. 
okay, you're not helping me, right? Now you don't tell them that in the interview, but you need to have them say, well, here's what happens when we go into the lunchroom, you know, and then you say, well, did this happen yesterday? Or when's the last time this happened? You have to get the very specific times that it happens and you get the typical, but you get very specific stories of the typical. And then you get stories of exceptions. Does it always happen that way? Well, not always. Well, give me an example of when it didn't. The best probing question, full stop, is give me an example. Best yeah. probing question ever. Yeah? yeah. And then, okay, when was that exam? You know, when, what, how, where, why, who, you know? Uh, but give me an example and then ask about the specifics of that context and then there's something there. And another thing to what Nick said about finding the right conversation. So from, so looking at the case studies that I've been involved in, I agree with that quite a lot because, uh, but, I would like to add one point in the sense that oftentimes you go into a case study and you think I'm going to find something about institutional logics or whatever. And then you do a case study and the logics framing or whatever framing doesn't really work, but then you let it sit a bit to read other literature. You're patient with your data set. And as if you're persistent enough, I think you can find, as you said, a conversation where it works, whether that will always be then fitting with the method you have and the overall thrust and esprit in that conversation is maybe a different question, but it, you know, give it some time. That's my experience. And it will talk to something. So, um, and that can change, you know, sometimes reviewers are helpful in finding that, but the, perhaps it's, uh, it's also more, more your own job to find the conversation that it works with. I mean, on some level, what we're talking about is getting uh, some project, some paper published. I mean, but they're, they're, they're very different types of failure, right? I mean, uh, uh, failure to get uh, funding for your PhD, a failure, what, what, what is more imminent for many users, you do your PhD, but you need to get that first job or you need to get your own funding for a postdoc, you know, so mm -hmm. you have to apply for grant money. Uh, or you apply for positions. And when I applied for faculty positions, I was on the job market in 2007, 2008. So I went to AMSIS to the interviews, to ISIS. Wait, did I go to ISIS? I remember going to AMSIS in 2007 to the interviews because it was in Aspen, Colorado. And it was the first time in my life that I wore a suit, basically. That's not quite true. And I went into the interviews and had no idea. And I didn't get the jobs. And now I look back and say, like, hey, thank heavens I didn't get the job because, uh, you know, they, they, they hired some idiot, <laughs> of course. Uh -oh. no, but, you know, so the, these are failures, right? In, in a sense, like that, that could be, uh, I ended up getting some other position somewhere else. But, I mean, this is probably what people associate with, with failure, yeah? failure to get in, failure to get a job or failure to get tenure. Yeah, but, you know, I think this is the difference. Uh, and, and this is actually, as a father, what I want to instill in my children. And it's what I would uh, recommend for anybody aspiring to an academic career is resilience, right? The ability to pick yourself up and keep moving. And I always tell my kids, life is a marathon. It's not a sprint, right? Uh, any given thing almost doesn't matter in the overall scheme. If you stay persistent, keep your eyes on the end goal. So not like I didn't, I went out to the job market a couple of times. Right. I finished my PhD in 2009. And, and uh, so the year before I was interviewing and no one hired me. And then the, the next year, uh, it wasn't looking good. And then I won an AIS award. And then all of a sudden people all wanted to interview me uh, for, for jobs. So, so it worked out well. But uh, it was looking really bleak there for a while. And then I got that. But this, and, and then I got, you know, at the University of Georgia, I got a job and, and, uh, and did well, but it's one of those things where persistence continuing <clears throat> any momentary thing is not a failure. It's a, <clears throat> it's a setback. Right. And we have to get used to that as academics in particular, because we get so many rejections, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's so elitist, right. We're not included automatically. We have to earn our way into any club, whatever club that may be in the editorial board at a journal or where you earn your way into everything and you don't get it handed to you. And there's no clear path uh, publications are all more rejections than they, even for those of us who publish, uh, at top journals, often we still get more rejections than we get uh, acceptances or, or revisions. Right. But there, I think there is a very important point that is attached to what you're saying. Um, so I think in many ways, um, you know, late stage PhDs, postdocs, assistant professors, um, I think very many feel an ex extreme pressure resulting from the share of rejections over the share of revise and resubmits and um, acceptances. And in, in that 
when saying that, I mean papers, grant applications, and job applications. Uh, and I think one thing that I've been thinking about quite a lot recently is uh, what what are the mental mental health, if you want, consequences of that? And because this is an extreme pressure, uh, the the likelihood of if we if we think of failure as rejections for, for the sake of simplification. The, the likelihood of failure is stati statistically speaking extremely high in the frequency as well because the the the, the, the rejections out, outnumber the revised and resubmits and the acceptances by far. So so I've been always sort of what is I think very important, I mean, particularly in the stages when you're not in a tenured position, is to find some way to deal with it, with this pressure where a lot of a lot of the crucial decisions that can have very material consequences are outside of your sphere of influence, right? It's like, it's not that you make the key decisions, it's the reviewers, the editors, the hiring committee, the, the, yeah. the, the grant funding agency, whatever. And um, this is something where I've been sort of, uh, where I think it's like really important. And I remember a conversation I recently had with a late stage PhD who was thinking about, should she go on to the um, academic job market, yes or no? Um, and I decided to be like quite honest. So I asked some very direct questions, like, are you ready to move and move internationally? Yeah. Are, can you stand this period of pressure that comes in, in this stage of your life? Are you, do you think you can handle it? And what's, what's your coping mechanism when you have a piece of work that you've invested, you know, yeah. uh, a lot of passion in, and then comes a reviewer and just stampedes over it. <laughs> And that happens. I mean, of course, the, the quality of the journal correlates with the quality of the reviews, but then it happens. It still um, happens. Yeah. Um, and this is something where I think it's really, really important that as if, if you feel yourself to be in that position, consider some ways where you can like cope with all that because it can become quite a lot, I think. Quite a lot to it, deal with. Yeah, absolutely. Right. So I, I do a lot of PhD training at the moment. Uh, so forgive me if I always go back to this sort of setting, but uh, <laughs> teaching a, a, a case on writing and publishing and stuff like this. And we spend a lot of time just on the simple fact that this is one of the very few professions where basically every piece of work that you do, you get written reviews on that. Where else do you see this, right? Maybe if you're a soccer player and then the, you know, they're the negative. journalists write about you. And it's negative. They're by default negative. By by default negative, by default critical, by default 90, 95% will be, this is the worst thing I've ever seen, you know? Yeah. And we get this very constantly. You know, my, yeah. my, my, my emails are full with stuff, how I've apparently done the worst piece, you know, ever conceived by mankind on 12 yeah. pages, on one yeah. piece of work that I've done. So I think you're absolutely right. You got to, you know, we spend a lot of time and you guys, you will get this, you know, and then you, you try to teach some, some very basic uh, things like, you know, it's not about you, you know, it's, this is not about you as a person. This is about this, this document and so forth. And yes, the reviewing culture has gotten better. Yes. By and large, I suppose, but you know, we have to live and we have to learn how to deal with this. You're absolutely right. And we have to develop mechanisms right. for coping with this. Yeah. yeah. So this is what you guys are saying that, you know, uh, and, and I think we're all on the same page. We're in a situation where we've chosen a career where you need to build resilience. And yeah. a lot of people would look at the things that we're doing and it's full of failure, uh, full of failures. As a matter of fact, failure is the norm. When you submit a yeah. grant proposal, expect to have it rejected. When mm -hmm. you submit a paper to MISQ, expect to have it rejected. Yeah. When you apply for that professor position somewhere, expect to have it rejected because chances are it will. So you're going to be failing all the time. The other way of looking at it is, you know, I, I work with National Science Foundation here in the U.S. a bit, and this is what they say. You submit your NSF application, you get rejected, then you submit the, you revise it, submit it again next year, uh, do it again, do it again. The fourth time, you actually have a pretty good yep. chance of getting published. They, the, the program directors have seen you, you've improved it, you know, you kind of whiz it, wheel your way in there. Uh, mm -hmm. After a few years, um, yeah. <laughs> the, the the journals, right? Uh, Amrit Tawana used to have this idea. So uh, I think we might have talked about this on a previous podcast. Amrit had this idea that if you believe in something, you send it to three top journals. If one rejects it, you know, anything could be rejected. So maybe they just have it wrong. But if three top journals reject your work, 
then it's not them anymore. It's probably you. You're missing something here. And <laughs> there's a lot of smart people. And at that point, and what he does is he just puts it in a drawer. He goes, if, if three top journals reject pass on it, then there's something wrong. I put it in a drawer. Whereas Kale says, hey, if I believe in the idea, I want to publish it. If I don't publish it in a top journal, I'll publish it in a, a second tier journal. If I don't get it there, I'll publish it somewhere. If I like the idea, I'll get it out somewhere and I'll keep, and I don't care where I publish it. I want it out there in the world, right? And I kind of, I, I like Kale's uh, view better because I get, you know, I have a tremendous uh, need to put my stuff out there, I guess. And I guess we're all kind of these, we need those ego boosts or something. And and every time you, you publish or get something or, you know, it, it helps, but so here we are in a situation, failures always, we can of course have more resiliency is the way to handle it and to, to have this attitude that it's building towards something over time. But how do we do that? Not everybody is like me where I guess I'm naturally resilient and I'm naturally just kind of focusing on my goals and, and expecting the setbacks. How do people, how do people cope? Like, I don't know what advice to give other than just suck it up and, and go do it and quit whining. Right. And well, I realize that's not sensitive to people's mental health. <laughs> well, I think with all the points you you've made are very right, but they, they have this outward orientation, right? You, you submit again, you, you not the first year, second year, but the fourth year, you, they will know you. Um, and you learn and you improve it, right? Yes. Yes, of course. But um, so th this is, this is, I guess, a very effective advice. I think a second complementary point is to, um, to ask yourself, like, how on a very daily basis can you navigate through this path, career path that has a, a, a sort of a dry period, if you want, where, you mean, you, you know, when we say you publish and you submit to three top journals that will reject your paper, by the time the third journal has rejected your paper, say one of them rejects you in the second round, there's easily three years have gone by. You know? yeah. um, um, and so what, what I've sort of, what has worked well for me, and I know that's just me, I don't know whether it works for others, is that when I, um, so, so turn the clock back to 2018, which was when I was assistant professor, non-tenure track in the Freie University of Berlin, and then I got the job offer for non-tenure track associate in Bremen, which was a five-year contract. And I thought to myself, okay, um, what will happen on the morning I wake up after this contract has expired and I will be unemployed, what will I do? And then this next question was, well, what can I look back at if that happens? What will be the, what can, what can I have to look back on in my professional life? And I realized that I said to myself, well, then I will have done a job that I, for the most part, I really enjoyed for nine years. Well, that's going to be great. Who can say that? I know a lot of people who hate their job and I wonder why they spend so much time doing that. Um, and that sort of made me think like, okay, what, what can I do on a day in day out basis, very routinely, very regularly to reduce the distraction that the whole publishing processes cause? Oh, right? dude. All right. So you and I are totally different animals. I would look at that and say, nine years. I have nine years. Where do I want to be in nine years? What do I have to do to get there? And it never occurs to me that I won't get there. So let's say it's a tenured position, right? Uh, I would just say, that's my goal. What do I have to do to get there? None of this protect myself. None of this that I enjoyed. No, I would be very much, this is what I have to do. This is what I will do. And for me, it's never, failure is never an option in the end, in the marathon. I will finish the marathon. The, what is the, at any given point, you know, so, so again, but, but I probably have a different uh, mental outlook. It doesn't, no, well, I, it doesn't mean to, I didn't mean to say that I didn't have the will to persist through all of that. It was just yeah. a safeguarding mechanism. Like what, what will I have to, what can I do then? And, and does it feel okay to think about it? What's plan B? Yeah. I have I have a different strategy altogether. I think I don't think I'll, I'm the guy that says like I want to you know look I reframe it as something positive in in hindsight or something. And I'm also not the kind of guy that's like I'm definitely gonna go there. A failure is not an option. I think mine is a little bit more more hands on and practical. I try to in the day to day I just try to focus uh, on the things that I can control and 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 keep 
call them a failure if I fail, not if if the paper failed because that's not in my control. So that's why when I said, oh, I, I think you know, that's a healthy, I, I that's regret, a very healthy. I answer. regret, I regret these two revise and resubmits that I didn't. Well, mm. why? Well, because I failed to be resilient. I did. In your control, you know. Someone yeah. else, so like you know, it was my control, and I, I didn't do it. I did, like I never considered a paper that was someone else rejected to be a failure. And then what that means is when I do a revision, I and I tell this to my the people I work with, like I take this paper and I take the old paper and ask myself, is this revision better? Mm. You know, and this is the best I can do. Is is it better than the old? And if I answer yes to those questions, well, good. That's all I can do, yeah, but, you know. And if they don't, if they don't, if they then say, "I'm sorry, well, we rejected," which happens, then I, you know, okay, that's fine because I can't control that anyway. What I can control is whether or not, when I'm given the chance to revise my paper, whether I can make it better. And if I can say honestly, this is a much better paper and it's responsive, and I'm happy with this, good. So you guys each came up with a very good mental health approach, right, Wrecker? What you're talking about is. Uh, control. And it's only focus on the things that you can control. And and of course, hold yourself to a high standard there. I think that's really healthy. And then Lori, you were talking about, well, if I did nine years, I did it in a job I loved. There's an element of gratitude there and appreciation for your situation. And uh, I was reading a little on happiness and, and really the number one thing that this pop uh, psychology that I was reading on uh, that, that makes people happy is that it's a sense of gratitude or appreciation for their good things in their situation, right? Yeah, but, but, but let me briefly continue, because I had a second thing I wanted to latch to that. What will I have when I look back? So the, what I sort of decided, you know, already before I went on to Bremen, um, already at, at the, in the Berlin days, was that I asked myself, what, what am I good at? Or what do I think am I good at? And what do I like about doing about my job? So... And that's different for everybody, I think. You know, what you're good at was some write, like writing grant proposals, others like data analysis, others like writing papers. And in the end, it all comes down to find teams in which you work. But what are you, so what is your own strength and what do you like to do? And for me, it's writing papers, doing data analysis, reading papers. This is what I really like. So I said, okay, I'm going to take, I'm try, trying to take a set of hours every day and do that. Because I, yeah. I, I like it. And I, I mean, smart. over That's time, the, the amount, the X amount of hours is declining for various reasons. Yeah. But I still try to hold on to that because this is something that I found myself really liking. And the, of course, it was, there was more time for that as assistant professor, a little less as associate, and now still a little less, but I'm still trying to hold on to that. And that was something that we're sort of on a day to day basis. I went into the office and this was the first thing I did for, um, yeah, for various time, um, for various amount of hours a day. And for me, it helped to really on a day in day out basis, enjoy what I did, have a strong commitment to what I did, pushing myself and co-authors further and further and further. Um, and then take some, as you said, gratitude or pleasure out of that, which then enabled me to see reviewer comments in a different light. You know, sometimes say, yeah, the person is right. We didn't think about that, fair enough. Or other points, it's like, you think, okay, maybe the person had a bad day or whatever. In my own view, we lived up to the highest standards we could. And I think this, this finding this, what am I good at? What do I like to do? Is perhaps something that, that, that is helpful maybe for others. In whatever that is, is that grant proposal writing, to teaching, whatever, but find what, what you're good at and what you enjoy and then do that, do a little bit of that at least every day. What I also started doing is in light of this, what can I control and so forth, is also reframe the success. Mm. Like I sometimes celebrate more when we submitted a paper <laughs> Yeah, into the review or the revision or whatever, then when we get the, the outcome. Let's be honest, you know, uh, I've never written an MISQ paper that has taken less than uh, three years and four rounds or five rounds or whatever, right? So, and then towards the end, it all converges. So, you know, it's going to happen eventually, but it takes another round, another round. And the final real decision, this paper is now officially accepted. You saw it coming a long time ago. And sort of, it really doesn't give a lot of gratitude anymore. What's more gratifying for me 
it's the sort of this first round revision we put really hard. We think the paper is better. And I think, wow, you know, this is the reason to celebrate. We did what we could. Well, for the rest we can't control anyway. So this is a step stone where we can, where we delivered something extraordinary. And that's a reason to, to, to celebrate. And I celebrate this more than actually the, the final acceptance at, towards the end. I was same with some students. You know, some of my students, my new students, they're writing the first ISIS paper. Now on the 3rd of May, I'll be incredibly proud of them. And yeah. I don't care what happens in September. I don't care. Like, I'm really proud for them to putting their 20 pages together. So is- Elena Karahana has that same view, and she tells her students to have M&Ms. So when you did that, celebrate, have some uh, M&Ms. That's her, <laughs> her, your gift to yourself to celebrate every time you meet a little milestone. Well, wait a second. Since when did they put alcohol into M&Ms? <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> wait, <laughs> is there whiskey and M&Ms that I don't know about? <laughs> no, but I mean, it comes down, what, what Jan says, comes down to, I guess, an important um, principle. I mean, you, the one aspect of is bring your own, bring the source of, of joy, if you want, back into your sphere of control. And the other is, I think, the, the, what the publishing or, or the whole system sort of leads to is this existence in the unachieved, you know, we're working always on the future paper, the future application, the future grant job application, whatever, we're waiting for feedback, hoping it will not be the rejection that it can be, that it, that it likely will be. Um, and I think what, what Jan is saying, it also brings back to existing more in, in what you achieve. And is, this is not to be mistaken as some sort of um, not working hard or anything. It simply means to take back some of the control over how you deal with it or how you deal with failure or rejection or whatever into your own sphere of control and not let it entirely in the hands of others. Because it doesn't yeah. mean that people wouldn't work hard or it doesn't mean that you're not committed to anything. Uh, it, it simply means that ex- particularly because you are so committed and you work so hard, don't let the judgment of other people to a hundred percent affect how you feel about your work. Absolutely. But, you know, in, in, in maybe in wrapping up, I mean, I also want to say that, I have no problem with this high level of failure in the way that this entire industry and profession is set up, that it is so elitist and so high room for error and small margin at the top, et cetera. That's just what it is. And it has to be like this, right? Otherwise it wouldn't be research. You know, if you want to do something where you know you're going to succeed, et cetera, this is not your, your job. So, so resilience is fine and gratitude is fine mm-hmm. and making sure you're, you, you control what you can control. All of that is fine, but also accepting that failure is part of this, yeah, um, and and that you're always gonna have more of your work rejected because more of your work will not be the great big uh, Newton uh, Einstein type of breakthrough. It'd be pretty arrogant to think that everything we do is brilliant. Well, it's not, and <laughs> it can never be. So I think I think that's also fine, right? So if people really have a fundamental issue with people criticizing and reviewing and maybe call, you know some of your work failing and people calling it out like that maybe that is the wrong type of job. Yeah, I didn't mean to say that. That I mean, what I was saying was sort of how can you navigate the situation? I wasn't saying the situation is per se wrong. Um, but this is exactly the reason why I, when junior scholars ask advice whether they should pursue a career <clears throat> in academia, I have, a sort, I have a set of questions that I sort of ask them quite honestly, whether they... Um, whether they are aware that this is this is part of the journey that that just belongs to it um yeah no i didn't mean to say i didn't mean to say that the uh, no 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 worries lori uh bottom line is this we're in a profession that has a lot of setbacks and if you don't have kind of the natural that i probably have a natural resiliency right where i i, I don't know i can brush off setbacks probably maybe uh, in a way that others uh, it would be more difficult for others. I think others, not everyone in academia has my uh, predisposition, but I think there are a lot of, but the bottom line is if you have that sort of predisposition that doesn't like failure, <laughs> you know, and, and the re- really interesting thing is that academia attracts a lot of A students, you know, really smart students that did well in there. And, and a lot of those A students just don't like failure. Uh, they don't like the the poor grades and, and that sort of thing. So so it is one of those things that you have to build up your coping mechanisms. Hopefully we we gave people some uh, ideas around those coping mechanisms. Wrecker, what were the what were what are your takeaways? How are we going to wrap this up? Well, accept 
accept that you know failure is part and parcel. Accept that they, you know this this is a job with high uncertainty, high risks, and, and you know maybe high rewards. I think uh, 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 be prepared to identify the sort of coping strategies that would work for you. Yeah, um, um, and to maintain resilience. I think resilience is key, and there are different ways for people to get to resilience. It could be by uh, focusing on things that you can control. It could be by reframing uh, failure or, you know, seeing things in a different light or by uh, uh, making sure you focus on gratitude or sort of, you know, positive moments or whatever it is. Uh, uh, the key thing is to find some way to become resilient um, because it is needed. Yeah. And and the, this, this good old metaphor of marathon, not sprint, that is so true. Um, you know, and so, so sort of sticking some of these sayings, they actually have some, uh, some deep truth to it, right? So um, I think, yeah, resilience is key. I think that's that's a good title, by the way. Resilience is key. It's a marathon, not a sprint. No, I hate that title. <laughs> oh, all right. All right. I don't know. So now reality has us back, right? I mean, I have to jump off to a different meeting. Nick, you probably have to write some more papers or read some more books or whatever it is that you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> and Laurie, Laurie, I don't know. What are you doing? You have to teach today or what is it? That's no, coming? I finished teaching. I uh, Talking about uh, failures or rejections, I have a paper that started as a little side project 10 years ago. We said we thought we had an awesome data set. It was a... Uh, it briefly, was a shutdown by Nokia, back then the market leader in cell phones, uh, in Bochum, Western Germany. Comparatively small shutdown, completely legal, yet a complete nationwide scandal. It, it was for two weeks on the table title pages of German news. We thought it's great. Reviewers at five journals didn't think it was any great. <laughs> <laughs> but the sixth journal has, has accepted it. So we're now... Very nice. The, Congratulations. Thank you. The, the final tables, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Resilience is key. Congratulations. That's a great Thank outcome. You. Thanks for thanks for coming on the show, Laurie. Really appreciate it. It was a pleasure. Thank you very much. And Nick, I'll see you again in a couple of weeks, I suppose. Hasta luego. <laughs> Bye-bye. Thank you very much.